Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I realize that the text in the bulletin says tonight's sermon is going to be from Acts 12, and it is. We're going to spend most of our time in Acts 12, but before we do that, we're going to read a very familiar passage from 1 Thessalonians. Tonight's lesson is entitled, Praying Boldly. Do you believe in praying boldly? Do you believe in asking God for things that may seem impossible? Uh, tonight we're going to look at some people in Acts that were praying boldly, but it didn't seem like they were expecting God to answer their prayer. Uh, first of all, 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 16, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's God's will that we rejoice. It's God's will that we're always praying, and it's God's will that we are constantly giving thanks. Tonight we're going to be looking at praying, and praying boldly. I'm going to tell a story. Uh, this came from back in 1540. This is not something that's made up. This is actual recorded history. Back in 1540, Martin Luther had a good friend and assistant named Friedrich Myconius. And Myconius was sick. In fact, he was on his deathbed. He only had just a short while to live. And he wrote a letter to Martin Luther and told him that, that he was about dead and that he didn't have much longer on this earth. And Martin Luther wrote him a letter back. And this is the letter he wrote. He said, I command thee in the name of God to live because I still have need of thee in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that thou art dead, but will permit thee to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will, and may my will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. Now that sounds pretty bold, doesn't it? Uh, would you be comfortable praying something like that? And I probably wouldn't either, but it seems that it's okay to boldly approach the throne of God. In fact, Hebrews tells us it is. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19, says this, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrew writer says, because Jesus is our high priest, we can go behind the veil. We can approach the throne of God. We can do it with boldness and with full assurance. God has given us permission to pray bold prayers. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 17, verse 20, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible for you. That's pretty bold, isn't it? Have you ever thought about praying for mountains to move? Jesus said, If we have faith, we can do that. Now that's fairly bold. Do we really believe that God's going to answer prayers like that? You know of people that have prayed big prayers and then had them answered. And I don't know about you, but over the last few months in our family, we've seen some prayers answered from everything from pain relief to apartments to airplanes. So I'm not going to put anything past the power of God when we pray. And that gets us to our text this evening. So now turn to Acts chapter 12. We'll begin in first verse to set up the uh, context for a sermon tonight. It says... Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. So the king was out to, to hurt the church. That was his mission. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. These were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So one of the apostles, James, the brother of John, had been killed 
And Herod saw that that made the Jews happy. Well, Herod wanted to do things to stay in good with the Jews, so he decided to eliminate Peter as well. So he arrested Peter. He was about to put him to death. He was about to face trial the next day, but we know how those trials work out. Peter was already going to be dead. And he assigned four quaternions of soldiers. Now, quaternion is four soldiers. So if you think about it, he assigned 16 soldiers just to guard one man. Herod wasn't taking any chance on Peter getting away. The idea was that these soldiers would change guard every few hours and there would always be somebody fresh guarding Peter. From the story, it sounds like the two of them were chained to him and there was one watching each of the two doors out to his cell. We don't know what was happening, but we do know that Herod intended for Peter to stay in jail and then the church started praying. Look at verse 5. It says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was being made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Well, they were praying without ceasing. The prayers were constant before the throne of God. And God heard their prayers. And he sent an angel to bring Peter out from prison. One man said that the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was the prayers of the church that fetched the angel. I uh, don't know exactly how that worked, but we do know that first we have Peter under arrest. He's in a locked cell with 16 armed soldiers, making sure he stays in that cell. Two of them are chained to him. He's waiting for the next day for the verdict to be read. Peter is about to die. And while he's doing that, what do you think Peter's doing? Well, the Bible tells us what Peter's doing. He's sleeping. Look at verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Would you be able to sleep if you knew you were going to die the next day? If you were in a prison chained to two soldiers, how could Peter sleep? Well, somebody said that he'd taken lessons from the best sleep therapist that ever lived. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, Jesus and the apostles are crossing the Sea of Galilee. Start reading in Mark 4, verse 37. It says, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he, that's talking about Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So how could Peter sleep? Because Peter had faith. Peter now understood God's will. Peter was doing everything he could to spread the message of Jesus. And so he was able to sleep there in prison that night because of his faith. Because Peter knew no matter what happened, Peter was going to win. Maybe the next day he was going to die. That would end his earthly ministry, but maybe he wouldn't. If he died, it would be okay. If he didn't, it would be okay because he knew that he was going to be with Jesus. Paul wrote the same thing to the Philippians about his possible death in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, when he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's how Peter was looking at it. Peter could sleep because he knew that no matter what happened the next day, Peter was going to be okay. And so he slept. Now, notice here, just because Peter believed that God could rescue him, didn't necessarily mean that he thought God was going to rescue him, that he would rescue him. Look at verse 7. It says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. I mean, Peter, they were praying that Peter would be released from prison, and then Peter was released from prison, but he thought he was dreaming. He thought it was a vision. He didn't realize that it was really happening. It seemed so wild, so outlandish, it never crossed his mind that he might really be being able to get out of jail. Uh, I read a story about a motivational speaker named Ron Culberson. 
and he carried a little Monopoly card with him whenever he drove. It was the get out of jail free card. And he kept it in his billfold, hoping one day he'd get a chance to use it. And sure enough, one day the police pulled him over, asked to see his license and registration. He handed him his license and his registration. And then he handed him the get out of jail free card. And the police officer looked at it and laughed and gave it back to him and said, I'm going to let you go this time. It worked. He got out of jail. He didn't have to pay a fine. Peter had a real get out of jail free card. The Lord sent an angel to turn him loose. It was unheard of. It shouldn't have happened. In fact, I don't recommend you carrying around Monopoly cards because that's not going to work probably. But for Peter, it did. But he didn't realize until he was out of jail, standing out on the street in the city, that he was out of jail. He never really expected it to happen. Look at verse 10. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. You see, God surprised Peter by answering his prayer. And I believe that God will surprise us sometimes with our with answers to our prayers. Uh, but the story doesn't stop there. Verse 12, When he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now Peter was supposed to be executed the next day. Uh, there's a large crowd of Christians at Mary's house, and they're all praying. We know from the beginning of this text that they're praying for Peter. We don't know exactly what they were praying, but what would you have been praying if you were in the early church and one of the apostles was in prison and they were going to kill him the next day? Well, you'd be praying that he'd be freed, that he'd be released. And next thing you know, here comes Peter in answer to their prayers. What they've been praying has happened. Look at verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So get this, Peter's out there, he's knocking on the gate. Rhoda comes to the door, to the gate, says, who is it? She said, it's Peter. And she's so excited, she leaves him standing out in the street. She runs back in the house and says, guess what, y'all? Peter's outside the gate. Peter's standing, knocking on the door. Verse 15, and they said unto her, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. She came in and said, Peter's standing out there. They said, you're crazy. It can't possibly be Peter. Peter's in jail. Peter's going to be killed tomorrow. She said, oh, it's, it's him. I, I recognize this voice. Peter's standing out of the gate. And then they said, okay, they must have already killed him. And that's just his angel that's standing out there. But she kept insisting that it was so. Verse 16 but Peter continued knocking. Think about it. Peter's just gotten out of jail. Peter's just walked past some guards that Herod's placed on there. Peter knows that Herod doesn't want him out of jail. And we don't know if they've realized that Peter's out of jail yet or not. But Peter didn't want to go back to jail. He's out there knocking. He's out on the street. And they're leaving him out there. Peter's probably looking over his shoulder, wondering if somebody has followed him. He keeps knocking. And they opened the door and saw him. They were astonished. They didn't believe Rhoda. They didn't believe their own eyes. Peter couldn't be free. Peter was about to be killed. But wasn't this what they'd been praying for? Yeah, but when they realized that Peter was free, they were still astonished. So were these people just foolish and ignorant? Uh, do we read anything about them just going through the motions of prayer? Did they really believe that God could do what they were asking Him to do. Because think about it, that's a pretty bold prayer. That somebody that Herod has in prison, that Herod's going to kill, will be set free, and yet their prayers was, were answered. There's nothing we read where God condemns these people. He doesn't say they lack faith. They believe that God could do it. They prayed for it. They were just surprised when it really happened. Verse 17, But He beckoning unto them with His hand told to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things to James and to the brethren. 
And he departed and went to another place. So once they realized that God had answered their prayers, then they went and told other people. They shared the good news. They'd been praying, but they had no idea what God had in mind. But once they saw Peter, they knew that their prayers had been answered. They could pray and God could do things that even a king couldn't prevent from happening. Tonight, I want to challenge us to pray some big prayers. Let's pray for some sick folks that need healing. Let's pray that the cancer in Brother Mark goes away, that he's healed, that he's able to come back and be with us soon. Let's pray for opportunities to spread the gospel. Let's pray that we'll find some way to reach out so that people will know that we're here, so people will know that we're standing for the truth. Let's pray for the people that we know that need the Lord. Let's pray for the people that have left this congregation that need to come back. Let's pray some bold prayers. Beginning of the lesson, I told you about Martin Luther writing a letter. Uh, as Paul Harvey would say, now let's look at the rest of the story. Luther wrote, I command thee in the name of God to live because I have need of thee in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that thou art dead, but will per permit thee to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will, and may my will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. Now when Myconius received that letter, he was on his deathbed. He'd already lost his ability to speak. He could write, but that was it. That's the only way of communicating. But from that day on, he started getting a little bit better and a little bit better. And uh, from then on, he got more strength. He lived for six more years after that. He rejoined Luther in his work, and he died two months after Luther died. Now, was he healed because of Luther's prayer? I don't know but it could have been. God can do wonderful things. We need to approach His throne boldly, believing that He can do that. But to have that privilege, you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. If you are a Christian, you're here tonight, do you need prayer? Do you need somebody to pray boldly for you? Is there something in your life that you need help with? We would love to pray with you and for you if there's anything we can do for you spiritually. Won't you let us know right now to stand to sing this last song?